Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash genre. Over 180,000 titles to choose from from your iPhone, Android, or Kindle. That's audibletrial.com forward slash G-E-N-R-E. Weirdo bookworms unite! We want to share our love of genre fiction with you. Fans of horror, sci-fi, fantasy, and more can stop by as we chat about what we've been reading. Welcome to a very special episode of Genre Junkies. Happy Earth Day, everybody. (laughs) Happy Earth Day. Oh, No, every day should be Earth Day. Yes. Oh, do you hear that other voice with us, Scott? Who was that? It's my good friend, my mentor, my Amy from the Pleb Lust. Hi, guys. Amy. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So excited to have you here. It's it's like having uh, my our log does not judge here in my living room. <gasps> it is. It's sort of a log uh, reunion. That's right. Our yeah. log has something to say about a book. <laughs> my log wants to talk to you about Bird Box by Josh Mallerman. Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> So Amy is the commander-in-chief over at The Bloodlust, which is an amazing podcast, an amazing website, and I am a contributor to both, more so the website than the podcast, but you guys can always find me there. Hence, where we recorded our log Does Not Judge last summer as we followed the Twin Peaks Return episodes. Ah, Such a great time. It was such a great time. Let's just record them all over again. Let's do (laughs) Oh, Let's can do. you please? <laughs> I know. Yeah. Take two. I want there to be another season of Twin Peaks just to have another season of Our Log Does Not Judge. You. Maybe you. you guys can do it from the beginning. Like do a rewatch. Don't tempt us. Of the whole show? Of the, the whole series? Yeah. I would love that. Don't can you threaten do that? me with a good time. Right. Well, you know what we're doing right now. Uh, it hasn't. We haven't started putting them out yet, but I am trying to bring Eddie around to understanding and liking David Lynch. Ah, so so far we have together watched Eraserhead, and we did a commentary track for it. Ooh, I haven't listened to that. Well, it hasn't can come I out yet, but you can. Oh, okay, that'd when be it why. Does. Yeah. Well, maybe you can listen beforehand, but everybody <laughs> else. I haven't watched Eraserhead. Should I? Should I watch it first, or should I watch it with your commentary? I think it'd be okay to watch it with commentary. As long as you keep the actual sound of the movie nice and loud, because the sound is like the best part. But yeah, it's it's kind of a, a way to get people to understand what he's doing, what kind of filmmaker he is. So we hope to do Blue Velvet afterwards and um, move on down the line. God, Blue Velvet. I'm going to need a stiff drink for that one. Yeah. <laughs> so is Eddie. You know that movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know that movie traumatized me. Oh, girl, I know. Yeah. So today, on Earth Day, it's Horror Day as well. And that's one of the reasons why we have Amy here, besides the fact that she's awesome. Obviously, she's a a horror aficionado, not unlike myself. That's right. We're horror buddies. We are. We're horror, um, whores? Hounds? (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) You could say either of those things, sure. Yeah. So let me tell you all a little bit about... Bird Box by Josh Mallerman. This is a post-apocalyptic story about a woman named Mallory fighting to survive with two young children in her care. The book is written in both flashbacks to the start of the incident and the drama currently unfolding. In the past scenes, we find Mallory banding together with a group of strangers and trying to survive and make life work. Mallory and the others are faced with an enemy that is nearly impossible to fight. Something is out there, and the moment someone sees it, they lose their minds usually killing others and themselves. The only solution is to move through the world blindfolded. Dun, dun, dun. What a setup. So I know, what a concept. Mm -hmm. It's a really unique concept that really sets up a a really scary story, really scary idea. Oh, yeah. I love the concept of this book. And one of the reasons that I wanted to have Amy here talking with us about it is because, as some of you might know, Netflix is currently adapting this uh, for a movie. IMDb and other places on the internet says it's coming out in December. So I wanted to kind of talk about this a little bit theatrically as well, and kind of how we think it's going to adapt into a film. Um, it's going to star Sandra Bullock, who I love. What? 
as Mallory. Oh, okay. Same, Scott. I don't watch a lot of her movies because they're not horror or Disney. So that's a problem for me. <laughs> but I do like her. And then it's got Johnny Malkovich. Johnny Malk. Do you guys like Johnny Malk? Of course. Uh, well, yeah. I, again, who? Okay. <laughs> um, who is he playing, uh, I wonder? I'm assuming Don, but I actually don't know. Could be Gary. Oh, it could be Gary. He's getting up there in years, old Johnny Malk. Yeah, and everybody else seemed to be around their 20s. Yeah, so I think they kind of aged the cast up a little bit. Oh, yeah, I guess they must I mean, have uh, if Sandy is yeah. Mallory. Yeah, because she's she's not a spring chicken anymore. Mm-mm. Um. Anyway, so I wanted to... Oh, and Sarah Paulson's going to be in it, too. Okay, I'm down for that. Yeah, I'll watch her in anything. Sure. I love her so much. I'm excited for this movie. I mean, of course, it's always scary when a book gets adapted. But so anyway, so while we're talking about the book, let's think about it a little bit in like a theatrical adaptation as well. Right. Amy. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> tell us about your experience with Bird Box. I read Bird Box a few years ago, uh, right before we started the podcast, actually. So it'd probably be, what, four years ago? Mm-hmm. Probably, yeah. I got it from Kitty who you might know if, if you listen to The Bloodlust. And Shout out to Kitty. That's right. Howdy, Kitty. And she was interested in it because Josh Mallerman is from Ferndale, Michigan, which is very close to where we live. Just a stone's oh. throw away, another suburb of Detroit. So we were interested, and he still lives there. It's not like he was born there and moved away like Madonna and, you know, all the other great people who left Michigan. So we were really interested in that for the local connection. And there is a lot of Mm -hmm. Michigan connections in the book, which I enjoyed. Yeah. There's lots of bodies of water that play a big part. And that's a big thing in Michigan. I can't drive anywhere straight. I have to go around lakes everywhere I go. (laughs) And uh, they also play euchre in it, in the book, which I enjoyed very much. That is, do you guys know what that is even? Uh, No. It's a card game. Yeah, I played it a long time ago, but ah. uh, Sandra doesn't like cards, so I don't. Nah, really I, do, I don't believe in it. card games. No, nah. nah. I see. Too badsies because it's fun. It's a Canadian game, but it made its way down because we're very close to Canada, as you may know. Yes, but I read it years ago, and I thought that you know the the concept is really fascinating and a really great idea for a book, and I flew through it and loved it. And then I read it again for you guys, and I had a really different experience. I still flew through it. I still thought the concept was amazing. But there were some some aspects of it that fell a little short for me on the second read-through, when I wasn't so anxious to find out what was going to happen, and I, I took my time a little more and thought about the characters a little bit more. Okay, okay. I can see that. That can be a good thing to get more out of a book, or a little bit of a different perspective upon a reread. This was a reread for me as well. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. I'd read it a number of years ago as well when, with my book club, mm-hmm. and it was my pick because I like to pick horror books, and some of them like it and some of them hate me for making them read it. And um, this book got a pretty good reaction from everybody. It traumatized some, which, to be fair, like, it's hard when you're horror peeps like us and... We're a little jaded. We're not, you know, we don't scare easy. Right. But we can still recognize a good concept. And I think that with the movie and everything coming out, I think a lot of people are going to compare this to A Quiet Place. Yep. And which is a bit unfair (laughs) uh, because they're both their own beast, totally their own beast. But I get it. It's this thing of like one of your basic, you know, human sensory things is you're, you're deprived of it. And of course, in The Quiet Place, you can't make a sound. And in this um, world of Bird Box, you (laughs) can't see anything, really, unless you know for sure you're in a cleared and safe place. Right. Um, But I really, really still enjoy this book. It's probably one of my favorite horror books, maybe ever. Like, it's up there for me. Yeah, I, I really, really enjoy it. I think it's really smart. And I really like... The way he writes characters, Josh Mallerman. And it's kind of made me invest in Josh Mallerman. I haven't read his whole catalog yet, but I fully intend to. Uh, how, Scott, how about you? Well, I thought Bird Bat. <laughs> bird Bat. Bird I bat. thought Bird Box. <laughs> <laughs> I like Bird Bat more. I thought Bird Box was genuinely terrifying. Good. Uh, it, it's actually really stuck with me since I finished it. 
Oh, it's stuck in your craw. Yeah, I uh, I think the concept is just so interesting that it really creates a lasting impression on you. And and like I still think about, oh my god, what if I couldn't see anything around me right now? How how would I how would I survive? How would I manage? Right. It, it's just a really scary idea. Yeah. Um. I, I guess I guess I'll start with the actual experience scores. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um. This book is an obsession for me. Yes. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night not to read new chapters, but mm-hmm. with nightmares. <gasps> Genuine nightmares because it of this book. It gave you nightmares? That's the best endorsement a horror book can do. That's a win. That's a win. And there was a moment when I was reading the book at night in, in my car. I was actually picking up Sandra, and she knocks on the door, and I was in the middle of this really tense part, and I hit my head on the ceiling of the car <laughs> because I jumped so high. Because I was so frightened. Amazing. You're like, they've come for me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, this it, this book just absolutely just dug its claws in me and didn't, and still hasn't let go. You were transported. Very much, yeah. Ooh. Um, Amy, how about you for our patented experience score? This is at least a page turner. Even the second time when I knew what happened, it was a page turner. Yes. I, yeah. I stayed up far too late. Reading it on a work night. On a school night. Yeah. I mean, I, I imagine that I imagine that this would be a page turner for most people. Although that's sort of getting to appeal scores later, so we don't have to worry about that yet. But yes, I, this is absolutely <laughs> a page turner. Um, I appreciate that. I, I with Scott, am in the obsession realm, obviously, since it's like one of my favorite horror novels. My favorite, well, I always say, you know, different things in this vein, but one of my favorite horror tropes, concepts, is anything that's really tension and anxiety driven, and because it just like really messes with me, and uh, this certainly did. I love that tension of like, you don't know what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, because the world is kind of unpredictable that you're in. I think the third person uh, present tense perspective of the book really does a lot to build on that tension yeah i I think i think the writing style is really smart and i I have a lot of problems with present tense writing Mm -hmm. but it just really worked for me in this book because it really just makes you feel like every moment is happening live yes that's exactly right yeah i also think that the way that it jumps back and forward in time by chapter almost like alternating there are a few times where to keep the momentum going of what's happening in the present or what's happening in the past they'll he'll keep it you know several chapters in in one time period but the way that it usually alternates i think keeps you on your toes too because it's like what's going to happen what happened back then what's going to happen now you know there's always something to be nervous about yes do you like when books jump from past to present Yes. I think it's a neat way of telling a story. I like nonlinear timelines. Ooh, good verbiage there. <laughs> I also have an issue with present tense in, in books, and it didn't bother me here. And I agree that I think it serves the, the momentum. Yes. My biggest problem is with first person present tense. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't written like that, which I think was a good choice for this book as well. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Well, Scott, now may we talk about characters? Let's talk about characters. <laughs> <laughs> so our heroine is Mallory. I guess I'll start. Uh, I really like Mallory. I found her to be a survivor and a fighter and certainly not perfect, but tasked with taking care of the children, these children that she's with in the present time. And then also everything she went through in the flashback, it definitely endeared me to her. Um, I was rooting for her. I thought she was smart. I thought she was resourceful. Again, not perfect, but I wasn't offended by Mallory. I was rooting for her. I was happy for her, and I wanted her to keep fighting. How about you guys? I found her to be really refreshing, especially in the way that she handles her pregnancy. Mm -hmm. She's very normal. She's not, I think part of it is because of just the source of it, but she's she has a really great growth when it comes to her character, her place in the world and her pregnancy mm-hmm. that I found very refreshing. And you're right. She's incredibly strongly written while still being human and and having weaknesses. Mm-hmm. She's just a really cool character. And that's not a spoiler, by the way. That happens very early on in the book. I think chapter three is maybe when 
Yeah. That's revealed. Her pregnancy, you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How about you, Amy? Uh, how do you, how does Mallory fare in your eyes? I think Mallory is a great character. Uh, I definitely didn't have any problems with her character. I, I like the way that she seems almost like two different people. You know, the Mallory yeah. when she's kind of, noted, you know, learning about all of this stuff and when it all starts to happen and she's so unsure of herself and she's kind of adrift in life, you know, mm-hmm. and doesn't have any confidence and doesn't really have any faith in herself and her abilities. Right. A- and then seeing and, and, you know, we don't really see the transition happen. We get to see, Mm -hmm. we go back and forth between naive Mallory and super capable Mallory. And we do hear her thoughts and stuff in the future or in the present time, you know, and we know that she still has doubts and she still has issues with confidence and she worries that she's doing the right thing. But think about it from her kid's perspective. What would they be seeing? They would be seeing this force of nature, this strong hard, confident woman. And that's what she became. And I think that that's really interesting. You know, you get to see this profound change in this character and you get to see that in a horrible situation like this, some people might actually find their best selves and find power that they didn't know that they had. So I loved her as a character. Oh, I'm really glad to hear that because I totally, totally agree. Who knows? We all like to theorize about what we do in these post-apocalyptic world in the situations. But like, what would you actually do? I mean, would you crack or would you like, as as Shakespeare says, would you screw your courage to the sticking place? Right, exactly. And and who knows whether or not you could even tell what you or I would be like, you know, there's not, yes. there might not be anything in your previous life that would give any indication of how you might fare. What I appreciate about the post-apocalyptic setting of this mm-hmm. is there's a lot of books that have that kind of a setting where oh God, I think, yes. oh, I could see myself surviving in this. Uh-huh. You know, I, I can I can toughen up and survive a <laughs> a, a horrible situation like this. I, I would be dead. <laughs> in this I, one? I could not survive this one. There is no way. You're a goner. I, I'm done. I would yeah. I would walk out into the light with my eyes wide open, just <laughs> praying to go nuts. I, I don't I would not make it. Why do you think this is different from, say, a zombie or a disease or something? Why do you think this one would be so hard to handle? Not being able to see? Yeah. It 100 percent. Yes. You're too spoiled. Not You're like, being I can't able adapt. to see what's around me would just destroy me. I, you know, a zombie you can take out with a sharp stick to the head. Sure. Not being able to see, not being able to navigate around you, I, I just, I, you that would drive me nuts. Yeah. That, that would drive me nuts. I wouldn't need to see the whatever to yes. go nuts if <laughs> right? I was not able to see. <laughs> and I know that that sounds, that sounds kind of weird. There, there are people who are blind in the world and they get along just fine. It's not just being blind. It's that there could be. You don't even know, but there could be something out there. So you think it's also maybe more the fear would get you? Yes. Yeah. The paranoia, the tension, the, is there one behind me right now? I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen The Quiet Place, but I think I could be silent. (laughs) I I think that I could live my life without making noise. I don't think I could live my life with monsters or whatever and not being able to see anything. I think that that would just... Your that, toast. That would I, I would be done. Okay. Um, I definitely think it's a different take on the post apocalyptic genre. I know a lot of people, you know, we kind of get fatigue with these things like dystopian, post apocalyptic, mm-hmm. you know, but it's definitely fresh, this one. Oh, for sure it is. I think there's a refreshing lack of, you know, the real monsters are people. I mean, they obviously that right. plays a role, but that always of ends course. up being the most important part of post-apocalyptic books or movies or whatever. Mm-hmm. And in right. this, it's like, no, the, the real thing is, you know, it's you and it's the monsters. <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, no, actually, yeah, that's there, of course, because people are people are creeps. But um, <laughs> yeah, these are bad. They could have taken are, like, it really a lot bad. further in that direction and they didn't. And I like that. I agree because, yeah, it's like you said, it's like, yeah, we kind of know. Like, we know. Sure. So give me something I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to talk too, too much about the boy and girl, but I really liked their presence in this book, the children. I thought they were cute 
and smart and um, a very good example of how resilient and adaptable children can be. Yeah, like little science experiments. And I think that's also a nice, refreshing, um, I don't want to say perspective, because it's not like the book is narrated from their point of view, Mm -hmm. but it definitely raises the stakes, right? Because we want to keep these kids safe. Sure, and give them a chance to be kids. Yeah. You get to hear Mallory and how how many misgivings she has about the way that she's raised them. Is this any kind of life? Would it have been better if they weren't ever born? You know, and... We know that she's done the best that she could, but it's it's heartbreaking to hear those doubts that she has and, and know that she had to be so strict and rough with them, you know, slapping them if they if they open their eyes and things like that. Absolutely. I mean, it's like a, it's <laughs> it's not your standard parenting. <laughs> Certainly not. It's not. I don't think it's comparable to 2018 uh, Western parenting. Mm-mm. And I think it's a really neat writing choice to explain the children to identify with the children through the lens of their mother mm-hmm. because there isn't a whole lot you can do to really relate to the way that a four-year-old thinks especially one that has grown up in this in this world they're so different from us but the way that she describes how they must feel or how they must interact with things is a really good lens to kind of explain what what they are who they are. Definitely. I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to give us our uh, our appeal scores then. Yeah, let's do it. So, Scott, I'll start with you. Uh, who does this book appeal to? What audience? Well, I had a specific score in mind mm-hmm. uh, until last night. What? And I, I changed my mind. At the 11th hour. Yeah, so specifically, it happened with my mom. Oh! <gasps> She's usually who I think of when I specifically when it comes to horror and, and, and genre books when I try to decide a score. Because she's not generally a genre junkie, especially not horror. No, and she hates horror. Yeah. But last night she told me that she really wants to see A Quiet Place. And she knows it's horror. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> and she said, and I quote, it looks genuinely scary in a good way. Oh. So because... A Quiet Place is also about a unique sensory deprivation sort of idea. I'm actually going to give this book a mass appeal score. I really think it's I really think it's already that good. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that kind of concept can bring in even a non horror fan. I actually feel confident giving it that. Interesting. How about you, Amy? I think that Scott is is probably right. I had initially thought of this as something with broad appeal. Just about mm-hmm. mass appeal, but I, I think that maybe some of the subject matter might get a little ugly for people that don't read yes. horror. But yes. judging by the reaction to A Quiet Place, I think he could be right. You know, uh, I think people generally react really well to uh, movies about and books about parenthood. Mm -hmm. and the struggles regarding parenthood because they can relate to that. And I think that gives things a a wider appeal than they might normally have, too. And Mm -hmm. I I don't think this is too – I think it's pretty straightforward, and I think it's something that, like we've talked about, people will voraciously read. I mean, that appeals to a lot of people. You want to have something that will suck you in completely for a couple days until you finish it? A lot of people like that. They do. Um, I'll be the slightly dissenting voice. And um, I'm going to stick with broad appeal. And that's just based off of my book club experience, really, because some people were just, like you said, that aren't totally accustomed to horror. It it got them a little much. It, you know, kind of hit them where they live a little bit, which I think is good. I mean, I think that's wonderful because I want people to be intrigued and get pushed out of their comfort zone a bit with horror, Mm -hmm. you know, of course. But yeah, I think it's. I'm just, I feel like it's wise and responsible (laughs) for me to say, maybe broad, maybe not mass. Okay, guys, we're going to go take a little break. Then we're going to talk about spoilers with Amy. So come on back. Enjoying the show? Please like and subscribe on iTunes. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Genre Junkies. And don't forget to visit the website, genrejunkies.com. Scott, 
Scott, will you have your mom read this then? No. No. <laughs> no. Mm -mm. Uh, she she will not be able to handle the actual labor scene. Yeah, because that was what I was thinking about is the hanging themselves, jumping out the window and their umbilical cord. <laughs> that might be a little much Bye. for somebody. Yeah. By her own cord. <laughs> I actually think she could handle almost everything else in the book very difficultly. I think she could handle it, but I that scene I think would break her. That'd be a little rough, yeah. Needless to say, we're now in the spoiler section and we can talk a little more freely and less guarded about the nuts and bolts of this story. Um, so, of course, Mallory uh, finds herself in this house when we're in the flashbacks and she's got um, housemates, flatmates, if you will, uh, a sordid little cast of characters composed of Tom, Don, Felix, Cheryl, Olympia, and then they're joined by another Gary. What did you guys think of the blend of personalities? in the house and how Mallory interacted with them and what that was like. I liked the characters in the house. My only complaint with them is that some of them don't really get enough screen time. Mm. Uh, each one has their own kind of characterization and their own personality. But Felix, as an example, is someone who has moments and definitely has a, you know, a personality, but doesn't really get to explore that. Right. I think that's actually really true. I kind of agree with that. Like, it's not a lawn book, and some of those characters are not fully baked. How about you, Amy? Yeah, that's actually my uh, my biggest beef with the book. Ah, especially upon reread? Yes, this is the, the thing that I did not really have time to focus on because I was just flying through it the first time I read it. Uh, <laughs> this time, yeah, they felt a little bit two-dimensional to me. Uh, especially Cheryl and Felix and Jules, they were kind of ciphers. I mean, they had, like like you said, they had their moments, but they didn't feel like fleshed out characters. And I felt like, as, as regards the other characters, uh, besides Olympia, who, <clears throat> Olympia was just, maybe she was meant to be a dum-dum. I don't know. I think she was. I think she's just a really soft, innocent soul. Maybe so. She kind of fell away from, you know, she fell out of focus to me the same way that the other the other three did, the other ancillary characters. But the big characters that move the plot along, Tom, Don, and Gary. I liked the characterization of Don because he had layers. And yes, and Mallory has, you know, mixed feelings about him and her opinions of him change over time and change back, just like with anybody, with a roommate or somebody that you are forced to be around. Mm -hmm. A co-worker. <laughs> yes, exactly. Tom and Gary, to me, were too black and white, too all good and all bad. Mm -hmm. I would have liked more nuance to both of their characters. Tom was painted as a little too perfect for me, a little saintly. And Yes. And then, you know. There yeah. also, it can go in the other direction where someone might be a little too bad, not have any redeeming qualities. Right. Like you definitely see some extremes <laughs> in these characters. And I, I totally get that. Um, I did like Tom, though. I found him so likable. I dug him. But I totally get what you're saying, especially upon a reread. You start to look at, you know, your characters a little bit more. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing that I will say to his credit, and this is my first read, but everyone in the book, to me, is kind of prevented through the lens of Mallory. That's true. So I think I think yes. any loss of character development can be based on that fact. It's just what she sees in them. And no, Tom is not perfect, but she sees him as perfect. Oh, I like that. That's a really good point. Yeah. It is a subjective narrator. Yes. She has her definite opinions about who she needs these people to be and who she perceives as a threat. So, I mean, basically all hell breaks loose. It gets hellish, I would say, because Gary is revealed to be a liar, liar, pants on fire. He's completely freaking insane. Man. Did you guys see that coming? Talk to me about that. Yeah, because Mallory saw it coming. She, she was on him right away. Right. She was so suspicious of him. But I mean, to that extent. The reason I saw it is because I noticed a literary trick that the author did. Tell us. Exploit it. When Gary enters the house and he's telling the story of what happened in the previous house, it's the only chapter in the book that's written in past tense. Really? Ooh. 
And what that does is create a basically a completely different world. It's written as a totally different book. Right. How do you like that? Wow, that's interesting. I did not pick up on that. Yeah. And when, when I was when I was about halfway through the chapter, I was like, wow, this is actually in this is in past tense. And I was noticing particularly how well all of the quotes were dealt with because every single paragraph was quoted because it's him telling the story. Yeah. But the entire chapter is dedicated to his monologue of telling the story of what happened to the house. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I don't think this is true. Mm-hmm. I think there's more to this story because there's just this whole chapter was written differently as if it's an unreliable narrator. That's a cool device. I like that. Clever. Cle- clever girl, Josh <laughs> Mallerman. <laughs> I um, I knew Frank was shady. Frank, Gary, eh, we're going to use this interchangeably, I think. But I thought he was like going to steal all their food or something. I didn't know he was so completely unhinged and that he was just like, I just want to create chaos and watch the world burn. Um, And I like that in a villain. Being uh, being unhinged definitely makes for a scary villain. Oh, and just knowing the way he was just, you know, whispering in Don's ear and like kind of leading him into insanity. That's intense. Oh, man. That's good stuff. I agree. I didn't think that he was Frank. Because it did seem a little bit weird that, okay, Frank opened up all the windows and you know, yeah. they they saved the place, apparently, but he decided to just leave anyway. Right. You're like, you're not telling me something. And here. so I, I felt like maybe he was kicked out or or and he didn't want to tell him that or, or something. They all killed him. Yeah. They all yeah. like ripped him apart or something. And he didn't want to like say that. I, I didn't think about that, but that's kind of the same. That's exactly it. Exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I and I thought, yeah, he might steal all the supplies or something would happen because it's made pretty clear at the very beginning of the book that everyone in the house dies. Yes. I mean, Mm -hmm. which is a great way to set up the tension of the book as well. You know, everyone is destined to either die or leave. Yes. I love that. And all the spots that she talks about that she had to clean up afterwards. It's the places where the people fell. Yeah. And each one of those she goes back to when she's walking out. She would have, if she had seen, she would have seen him laying here. And it's the same places that she had to clean afterwards. I thought that was a great touch. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot and missed that. What? Yeah. Well, no, I, uh, at some point in the book, there was a point I was like, I wonder if they're going to die or if they're all going to leave. And I had forgotten that portion of the book at the very beginning. But you're right. Yeah. yeah. And she won't even go. She, there's that the big spot from the attic and she won't even... She didn't attempt to clean that. She doesn't even go over there. Oh, yeah, because that's just, that's too gnarly, man. Oh, Scott's like mind is blown right I have now. to do a reread of the book, clearly. <laughs> it's not going to take long. You might as well. Yeah, I think that well. that's something that you, from the two of you rereading the book is good that you got because yeah. not knowing what was going to happen in the end, I, I didn't catch any of that foreshadowing. I mean, I think it sunk in my head. I just don't, it didn't. It helped you build the tension, but you mm-hmm. didn't like, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. So, of course, the uh, the piece de resistance is the births. Uh, I, for some weird reason, <laughs> just thought that both of the children were going to be um, Mallory's, that she was going to have twins and that Olympia was going to lose her baby. So I thought that was interesting that she had hers and Olympia cracked. But she had a little bit of a thread there to reality to make sure Mallory got her baby. But of course, that is the, this is what's going to separate, I think Amy kind of said this, the horror fans from the casual horror fans, because the birth is gnarly. Oh, boy, howdy. That whole scene is so intense. And I don't even don't know even... if it's... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was going to say, I just don't even know if it's possible to uh, hang oneself by one's own cord, but I loved it. Yeah, I'm not sure. I can't really visualize how that would have worked, but, you know, Mallory couldn't see down. it either. So we're yeah, also exactly. just going to have to take it on faith. <laughs> I, and that's another thing. I mean, we don't see, nor do we really know anything that happens downstairs when mm-hmm. Gary actually flips and, and takes all of the stuff down. We don't know. Yeah, that could be lies. And it's still, it's still so intense and so scary, even though we don't even know the details. We only get a little piece from what we only see what Mallory sees and what she's being told. Yes. It's totally different. But of course, the birthing sequence reminded me of Mother a lot. The movie, mm. of course. Mm-hmm. And um, just the absolute, like, 
Oh, cheesy, crazy. I mean, it's just like, it makes you ill. It's just so, such a visceral body thing. Yeah, they both are akin. So so if you like that part of Mother, you'll probably like this part of Bird Box. <laughs> and you're probably a sicko. <laughs> guilty. Guilty as charged. Like us. Like us. Childbirth is inherently horrifying. Oh. Well, I mean, I don't Agreed. mean like I'm scared of it. I just mean it's it's incredibly painful. Yes. It's risky in itself. Yes. There's body horror involved. I mean, there's there's fluids. Yes. There's lots of Exactly. And to then add on top of that, a truly horror world, a horrifying experience around it to create basically a timetable of when it has to be done to create the necessity to protect yourself, your child and someone else while giving late while while being in labor. Mm -hmm. That is just this huge pile of terror that yeah. I, I can't think of many scenes that have really scared me and and put me in as much tension as that scene. Good, good. And I love that, you know, she's really struggling because she could open her eyes and this will all be over. But she doesn't, you know, she fights through it. Um, And that's part of when I really was like, oh, go girl, you got this. You can do this. Such a strong character. You're right. Yeah. That's the thing. It's so easy in this to give in. It's not like you would be wandering into a pit full of zombies or in a Mad Max situation where you might be, you know, you might Mm -hmm. stay alive for a very long time or have a very violent end. This is just, you just open your eyes. That's all you have to do. And And it's not going to be you. Yeah, exactly. But she doesn't do it. Um, At first, when I read this, I was like, Olympia is kind of a throwaway character. But then I was like, you know what, though? She's just who she is. She's not Mallory. And and so now I'm like, I've made peace with Olympia because I appreciate that she's kind of um, a beacon of kind of softness in a very harsh world. Maybe I was too rough on Olympia. You're right. Not everybody finds their inner strength in this reserve of power that they didn't know they had <laughs> under duress. Some people just, you know, <laughs> existing still. Like, <laughs> they just fold into grunts and here's my baby and out the window I go. Yeah, I mean, she she could have been even more worthless and she wasn't. So you're right. Yeah. God, does that happen? Would you get that in sync with somebody that you might go into labor at the same time? I mean, I am in sync with all the women in my office, but yeah. not to the point where, you know, yeah. I don't know. Is that a thing? Well, I think it might be a thing because you can go into labor from being so scared. Ooh, you are like okay. so traumatized. So I think that was that's how I married it. Okay. I also like how um he cleared up some things that could be maybe too open ended, like yes, animals can be affected by the creature, the phenomena, whatever it is. Videotape, not good. Can't look at it through videotape. You're gonna get got. Mm-hmm. Little things like that, and like where she had to journey out into the world. I like that because otherwise you could be like, well, I didn't, you just blah, blah, blah. But I had a hard time coming up with counter arguments with how to fight this thing. Yeah, I would. I'd, I'd try and find a blind person. I know that if I could. Yeah, yeah right. Teach me your ways. Help a, me. a seeing eye blind person? Yeah. <laughs> oh, <God>. Yeah. <laughs> um, best friend. It actually friend. makes a lot of sense if you think yeah. about it. <laughs> One thing I really want to talk about with you guys is the infamous Well, there's two infamous scenes. The first one being the man they encounter as they go down the river. Oh, boy. That was one of the scariest parts to me. And that is a good example of people are still scary. But um, it was kind of fresh for me, that perspective. And so frightening. So, so utterly frightening. Because as with all of the present scenes, Mallory is worried for herself and for the kids. Right. And they're so... So vulnerable. Yeah. They're so vulnerable out on that boat. I mean, imagine not knowing what's approaching you. It Mm -hmm. could be a a stick or it could be a wolf or it could be a crazy person. Yes. I mean, really, there's a few, like I said, there's a few iconic scenes that happen as they're going down the river. I have a question about that scene. Do, Do you think that he was affected from the very beginning or do you think that he saw a creature while he was talking to them? From the beginning. Yeah. I think he was completely unhinged and was kind of luring. Like, here's some candy, get in the van. But at the end of the encounter, he starts to scream in, in insanity. 
Yeah. And when he wasn't like that at the very beginning, he no, was just, hey, no, it's fine. You can open your eyes. It's no, no, nothing here. See, no, he was leading her down the primrose path. Amy, what do you think? I think that maybe he was someone like Gary who might have been mentally ill already. And maybe yeah. it affects people that already have issues mentally differently. And maybe it takes longer or mm -hmm. maybe it gives them some semblance. They're able to hang on to something because they were yeah. missing something uh, initially. I like but that. That was kind of my my guess. It takes maybe it takes them longer to change. Maybe it it, it makes them go a different kind of crazy instead of not being able to deal with it and just wanting to end their life, they, I don't know, they become more hysterical and unhinged. Maybe those are the ones that take more people out with them when they finally do end it. I agree. That's totally what I got as well. Um, what did you guys think about that wonderful tense scene? And I think this would be a good one for the movie. I hope they keep it. Where she like goes to the bar, the club. Oh, terrifying. I cried. You cried? I cried. <sighs> yeah, because of the, yeah. That was that was the one character that I couldn't handle. It, and that's just the way it is with everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I You hate to hear and see animals die. It's It gets you. It's yeah. taboo. Yeah. Poor Victor. I, I really liked him. And I was so, so pleased when they got the dogs. And we know mm. the other dogs didn't fare well either. But yeah. Poor thing. Um. Scott, I think I know the scene you're talking about when I snuck up on you in the car. Mm. F talk to us about that scene. Okay, so this was the scene when when Felix is going out to the well, and he's it's when you first kind of start to understand about the sounds and how, how everything gets quiet, and you can kind of hear the creature walking around. And, you know, he goes out to the well, and he hears something that's kind of scary, and he comes back, and he goes out to the well for the second time, and it gets, like, really you know, kind of frightening and he's describing the sounds and how he can sense it around him. Mm -hmm. And he comes back and he goes out a third time and he's, and he's really hearing things and he's scared. And then there's a knock on the window of the car and I just lose it. <laughs> <laughs> really at that moment, like right when something is a, something would normally happen in this tense scene. That's when in the dark, someone knocks on the window of the car and I'm just, I'm done. That was perfect timing, Sandra. I really had no idea. It's just in your blood. You know it. Natural. It is. It's it's in my horror blood. That's my That's blood right. type. Horror. Same with you. Just having Scott describe that sequence uh, just now made me a little nervous. Oh, right. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I think that's um, that's the type of stuff when I think about this being a movie that'll build that good visual tension. Of like, you know, a blindfolded person kind of fumbling their way outside and then like the sound goes and it's like, oh, shit. I'm having trouble figuring out how they're going to actually film this particular book, though. <sighs> Me too, man. They could really overuse a uh, narrow depth of field so that you have a character who's blindfolded in front of you and you can't see anything behind them and you're close up. Mm -hmm. Or even you can have it a little bit further out but still a narrow depth of field and you see the creature behind them and they're completely blurred out but that's really the only thing i can think of and that could get very old eventually i don't think we're even going to see a blurry creature i don't think we're going to see anything but then what are you filming i mean i agree i don't think you should show the creature I'm, I'm that's what i'm the most worried about because i love the idea that there is no description Amy, are you having flashbacks to Gerald's game like I am? <laughs> of like, we can't film this movie. It's impossible, they said. Yeah, there have been there have been a lot of movies like that. And to varying degrees of success, they've been able to pull it off. This is mm -hmm. going to be tough. There is no monster d visually. There's, there's nothing for them to show. But if you have the right person make this, it could be great. Because there's no yeah. there's no monster for them to screw up. <laughs> and I hate a screwed up monster. Uh, the lady who's making the Bird Box movie, I've never, I've never heard of her. I did recognize the name of the other movie that she made, but I've never seen it. And her name's Susanna Beerson. She does not ring a bell to me. Nope, I got nothing. But what's the other film that she's done? Oh crap! In a Better World. Didn't see it. I haven't seen. I don't think any of these movies. The Night Manager, which is a series. It's Serena. I think she's Danish. Yeah. So these are a lot of. Danish film? It almost feels like maybe they picked her then because she had a good vision. I That's hope what I'm so. hoping, yeah. Yeah. They, they didn't just give it to someone who made a, 
a good independent horror movie that this woman has not done horror before. So maybe that'll be good. Maybe that's promising. Guess we'll see. So I'm I'm encouraged. Yeah, I'm oddly encouraged. We haven't talked too much about the monsters themselves in this. Of course, I brought it up because I love the idea of these monsters. My favorite thing is not knowing and not being able to see and not having a good idea of what we're working with, you know? Yes. Fear of the unknown. I love the idea that these monsters might not even be malicious. They might not give a crap about Thank us. Thank you. Thank you. We just can't exist in the, our minds can't incorporate the idea of them and the, the actual image of them into ourselves or we it just short circuits everything what a cool idea that is brilliant i i would say brilliant um amy what's your personal pet theory about where they came from i think that they probably it seems like if they were just some beings that had always been here this couldn't happen right there would have had to have been something some way for us or some event that happened that made it so that we could s- suddenly start to perceive them. I think they probably came from elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And maybe I, I don't think personally that they meant us any, that they mean us any harm either. I think they just came here and blew our minds. Are, are you thinking aliens? You thinking extraterrestrials? Yeah. What about you guys? Um, I am very much in the same vein you are. And I don't think that the creatures are necessarily malicious. And in fact, there's some times when they're interacting that you're like, this doesn't seem like the act of a malicious being. My personal pet theory is they are (laughs) interdimensional travelers. Okay. Who found their way through. And our minds, since, you know, we don't use a lot of our brains and get into cool quantum physics shoes, um, we can't comprehend them. Mm-hmm. We just can't comprehend them. They could even look like people, but it just it just doesn't compute. We're not coded to understand people moving through dimensions like this. But yeah, I totally agree. And I love that you said that, that um, I really think they are confused. Maybe they didn't come here even by choice. Our worlds are just kind of overlapping with each other. And they're not quite sure what's going on either. They, <laughs> people see them. They're probably waving. Maybe they're holding out their hands like, hey, 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 neighbor. Hey, buddy. They and brought, like, then the a person fruit like, basket. And we- <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They just want to make wine. friends. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we're like, ah, and we lose our shit and blow our heads off. I hadn't thought about it, but we could be, we could mess with them just as they mess with us. Absolutely. Who knows what we're doing to them? Yeah. What I like about the book is at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Of course. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter where they came from. It doesn't matter whether they want to or not. But I, I, I'm kind of in Sandra's camp. I think they are extra dimensional beings, uh, creatures that take shapes that our minds just cannot comprehend because they are just extra dimensional. Yeah. I don't know if they're innocent, though. You think they might be trying to conquer? The, the, well, maybe. Colonizing us? Maybe. Specifically, there's two scenes that I think of when I think of them being malicious. One is actually when they surround and then rush into the house when the doors are opened by Gary during Mm. the actual pregnancy scene. I mean, they talk about there being multiple that come in. Yeah. And then they all end up leaving. But there's there's something about that that just doesn't seem like something that someone who's just checking it out would do. They're like, this party's dead. Let's bounce. Literally. And two, at the end, when she's actually at the fork and it's li- it's lifting the blindfold away from her face. See, that's my biggest argument that they're not bad. It's gentle. It's not violent. I wonder about that scene, though. That's the one that's the scene. Conversely, I guess, that makes me wonder if they might be malicious. Oh, it's so interesting. I love that you can interpret it two different ways. I love that. I wondered what that was about. I wondered how you guys read that. And now that I know that we have different ideas about what it means, I'm even more confused. I love it. That's the type of stuff that I eat up with a wooden spoon. It's just delicious to me because I totally got it that they're like, can I, can I just see? And she's like, no, no, no. Gentle touch. Gentle touch. And she does say, no, this is mine. Yes. And it lets it go. Okay. Because maybe, and I don't know that it speaks English, I don't know it speaks the king's English, but I think it could recognize her tone and maybe her body language. Maybe. But maybe they're like people. Maybe some are good and some are bad. 
Could be. They don't really touch people. No. At all. Maybe maybe really their only way to communicate is through sight. And could you imagine if 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 you speaking to somebody, you know, maybe of a different total dimensional being, but you're trying to communicate with someone yeah. and the act of talking drives them mad and they kill themselves? That would be really difficult. So maybe maybe that is how they communicate is through sight. That's yeah. that's their 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 way of talking and they just yeah. want to talk to somebody. Yeah. But they can't. Right. And like I said, and they're like, oh, my God, what's with these fragile little creatures? They can't handle us. And then they create uh, mass murder. <laughs> Sucks. I love it. I love the ambiguity of uh, of these. Exactly. Um, I would really like to talk about the end of the book with you guys. Were you satisfied with the ending, Amy? I was I was very scared at first that she had just gone from bad to worse. I don't know if you guys had that feeling, too, but it it was quite a surprise and a shock to find people voluntarily blinding themselves. And I was so afraid that she was going to have to try and figure out how to make an exit with her kids. Luckily, that didn't happen. Uh, I wondered about I wondered about what you guys thought about the choice to do that, to add that part in. The specific that they originally blinded people? Yeah. And having her find that out, right, pretty much at the end of the book. Um, I mean, I like that they're like, oh, no, it's okay. Like, we don't do this anymore. (laughs) Like, we were just, you know, we're trying it on for size (laughs) to see how it worked. Um, It's not a bad idea, actually. No, and it's one that she thought of. Uh, that yeah. she thought about anyway. Don, I think, brought it up at first, but that was something she considered. I like that the author created a history for this community that she finds mm-hmm. and, and making them more human as opposed to, oh, OK, I just I found, you know, the new horror. Well, or the opposite. She walks up and says, OK, I, I found the new Eden. This is the right. Oh, yeah. It's all I- perfect. Yeah. And and I agree. I think that the idea of blinding children, of, of of blinding on purpose to prevent from going mad is, it's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no bad ideas in brainstorming. It, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe there are. <laughs> I think that that's something that could have been explored maybe even in a different book if you, you, you didn't necessarily need to be in it. But I, I like that he added that little bit of history to it. Uh. When we were talking earlier, I forgot to mention this about how we would fare in this world. That is definitely my my hippy dippy side is I would let everybody into the house. I would let everybody in. I would not turn every anyone away. I'd be like, here, do you want some bread? Do you want like some water? We have books like and I would probably get us all killed. <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think I'd be able to turn anyone away either. I can't yeah. imagine doing that as much as I like to pretend that I hate people. I, I pretty much, yeah, I would have to let everyone in. I understand, though, yeah. the the people not wanting to take in two pregnant women. I mean, they're lucked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, great. Another pregnant lady. Cool. Yeah. But um, everybody pulls their weight. So that's good. Well, until it all hits the fan. Yeah. Yeah. But I did like that, um, that we don't know What's going to happen with Mallory and the kids? I, um, I like, I love an ambiguous ending. I love that, you know, it's not all neatly tied up in a bow. Maybe this, well, this community's lasted a pretty good time that they found. Maybe it will fall apart. I don't know. But I think, I think they're going to be okay. And there's hope that there's other places that are doing the same. Yeah, and I think that, I think it's pretty safe to say that we've seen enough of Mallory to know that even if things don't work out at this place, she's capable and she will make sure that she and her children are okay. And I think she gets that sense too. You know, it wasn't just waiting for somebody, oh, thank God we're rescued. You know, I think she f- feels at the end, you know, that that I did this. I did yeah. this. My kids and I did this. So to put a pin in this episode, let's uh, wrap up with our execution scores. Amy. How many buckets out of five do you give Bird Box? I would give Bird Box four buckets. Four buckets of nice well water with probably nothing floating in it. It's probably fine. It's you probably don't really fine. know. I'll drink it. I, I would try it. Yeah, you're probably drinking a mosquito eater in there. Maybe, but still, it's nice water. It's not the buckets that they have to dump in the pit. Four water buckets. 
four. I, I would almost give it five, but his his writing style, I don't I don't quite love his prose, and I, I didn't mm-hmm. quite think his characterizations were perfect, but absolutely four. I'm going to give it four water buckets and a waste bucket. So four four and a half buckets. <laughs> four <laughs> usable buckets and one that serves a purpose. <laughs> I see. <laughs> um I mean I've I've gone on about how much I loved the book and I am giving him a lot of I, I guess I'm giving him a pass on the okay characterizations of some of the secondary characters because I I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt that it was a literary choice because they were all seen through the lens of Mallory. Mm-hmm. But I think that there really could still have been more of the characters, which is the only reason why I'm docking anything at all, because I think his prose for me was perfect, especially, you know, I talked about it earlier, but the way that he chose to write the one chapter with Gary in past tense was just such a masterful stroke that I, as far as the execution of this book, I think that it was done so masterfully. A nice, clean guillotine cut for the execution. <laughs> um, I will also, I wanted to point out, uh, Kitty actually did a review of this on the Bloodlust website. That's right, she did. A, a little while back, so you can always check that out, too. We almost did an episode on this, actually. Oh, well, I think I think there's going to be an episode when the movie comes hey, out. Hey, 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 yeah. books are our thing now. No, you're right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> We licked it. It's ours. Okay. Um, I'm going to give this book it's definitely a, a five water bucket out of five. And I kind of agree with Scott. Like I, some things like a little bit of half-baked characters or whatever, I totally can give him a pass on because there was so much more about this book that I really enjoyed. This is one of those when people um, ask me like, oh, give me a horror book to read. I always say, well, you have to read Bird Box by Josh Mallerman. You have to. And now, especially since there's a movie coming out, it's like, you gotta get ahead of the curve here. I just think it's smart. It's clever. It moved me. It made me feel emotional. It made me feel frightened. I love horror that gives me uh, so many different sensations like that. So I say, good show, Josh Mallerman. Five buckets. Thank you. Good Amy, show. Thank you so- uh, good show. Good show. Good show. <laughs> Amy, thank you so much for being on here. Um, we love you. I love you. You're amazing. You are definitely a mentor to me. Everybody, if you're not listening to the Bloodlust or going to the website, what are you even doing with your life? <laughs> thank you guys so much for having me. I love your show. I've learned about so many books from it, and I'm so excited to read The Troop and the end of it. <gasps> yeah. I'm so excited <laughs> to hear what you guys do next after this one. Ooh. And I'm sort of sad that I already know how this one goes, so I don't get to listen to it. But I'm still very pleased that you had me on. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being on. You are the one who inspired us to actually get off of our chairs and start recording this podcast. Well, it feels like you guys have been doing it for years. You seem completely comfortable. (laughs) Thanks, Amy. We learned from the best. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us for Horror Night on uh, Earth Day. And as always, we encourage you to read past your bedtime. I haven't uh, gotten to talk about A Quiet Place with the uh, the others for our show yet, but I, I didn't like how that monster looked. I don't know very much about the movie, but I just picture a giant ear walking around with arms and legs. <laughs> You're close. It's actually a giant ear of corn, but it is a giant ear. It's not a giant ear of corn. It's an him. ear of corn made up of tiny ears. The, the yes, kernels exactly. are smaller ears. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's um, very frightening. If that, they did that, that's that might be interesting. very Lynchian, actually. Right? And I'm picturing it has human hands and human feet. Mm-hmm. No, goat and little legs. little shoes. Goat legs. Oh, go- oh, I love a good goat leg. Yep. I mean, if you're in doubt about a creature, just put a goat leg on it. Yeah. Give it some horns. A little, little cloven hoof, a little horn action. <laughs>